Hello. In the last chapter, we looked at the start of World War II, including the rise of totalitarian leaders, the aggressive actions of those totalitarian leaders, and the United States policy of neutrality, and how we slowly moved from a position of neutrality to all-out aid, short of war, uh, in assisting our allies. And then we finally were drawn into the war by the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. And so in this chapter, what we're looking at is the United States in World War II. And we start by looking at the war in Europe and North Africa. Our learning objectives for this section is to explain the Allied strategy for fighting the war in Europe and the major battles of the European and North Af African theaters. Defeating the Axis powers depended on control of the seas. The Atlantic needed to be kept safe for shipping so that soldiers and goods could be transported from the United States to other allied nations. Germany had a very powerful navy including new surface ships including the giant Bismarck and they had of course their U-boats. Germany used tactics to increase U-boat effectiveness, such as the so-called Wolf Pack. U-boats sent hundreds of ships and tons of supplies to the bottom of the sea. At the time, the German Navy lost few of their boats. The entry of the United States into the war would help turn the tide in the Battle of the Atlantic. American shipyards began producing new ships at an amazing rate. The new ships were used to form larger, better equipped convoys, which could cut down the effectiveness of U-boat attacks. Allied aircraft protected convoys from the air. The Allies broke the German code system, which was called the Enigma. The Allies began to gain vital information about the locations and plans of U-boat formations. Finally, the Allies had an advantage over the Germans. Now we begin to look at the war in the Soviet Union. Hitler broke his non-aggression pact with Stalin and invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. The Soviets then joined the Allies as enemies of the Axis powers. At first, the Soviets seemed unable to stop the German Blitzkrieg. However, the bitter cold Russian winter proved to be a great ally. Still, the Germans uh, had a vast portion of West, the Western Soviet Union and besieged the city of Leningrad. The Germans attacked Stalingrad in August of 1942. The Soviets refused to let Stalingrad fall and Hitler suffered a stunning defeat in early 1943. Stalingrad marked the beginning of Germany's collapse in the Soviet Union. Soviet forces pushed Germany out of Russia, but lost 12 million soldiers and millions of civilians. Now we look at American forces in North Africa. So first, let's answer the question, why was North Africa so important? By controlling North Africa, the British could protect shipping on the Mediterranean Sea. They needed the ability to ship oil from the Middle East through the Suez Canal. So what was the result of the fighting in North Africa? Well, Italy could not drive the British from Egypt, and Hitler sent troops under the direction of Erwin Rommel, known as the Desert Fox. After a back-and-forth battle for North Africa, the Allied forces handed the Germans a major defeat at the Battle of El Alamein. And now let's look at the Italian campaign. British and American forces invaded Italy in 1943, and the Italian people forced Mussolini from power. But Hitler rushed in into Italy to stop the Allies. Now the Allies decided to attack Italy because they considered this to be the weak underbelly of Europe. They saw this as the easiest target. Uh, and this actually created a little bit of tension with the Soviet Union because the Soviets actually wanted the United States and Great Britain to launch a front in, in Western Europe, 
uh, particularly. Uh, they wanted us to maybe try to invade France and try to recapture that territory, which is something that we plan to do, uh, but they wanted us to do it sooner. Uh, and of course, that would take pressure off in the Eastern Front as the Germans would have to divert uh, attention to fight on the Western Front. Uh, but we, we realized Italy would be, a, would be easier to attack. So that's why we attacked there. And like I said, Mussolini ends up being forced from power, uh, but soon the Nazis come in and, and uh, they end up freeing Mussolini. Now we begin to look at the D-Day invasion of France. Uh, to end the war as quickly as possible, the Allies planned what was known as Operation Overlord, which was a large invasion of mainland France. The Allies landed at Normandy on June 6, 1944, called D-Day, uh, and began to march on France. So taking a look at Operation Overlord, this was the planned invasion of France from the beaches of Normandy. Uh, General Omar Bradley led the American troops. Good planning and speed were vital. The Americans were concerned about the V-1 flying bomb and the V-2 rocket. So once again, D-Day was June 6, 1944. Um, <clears throat> the Allied force consisted of 3.5 million soldiers. Then the Germans were slow to respond. There were an estimated 10,000 Allied casualties, including 6,600 Americans. Uh, the Allies landed almost a million soldiers and 180,000 vehicles. Uh, overall, the D-Day invasion was a tremendous success. Part of setting up this Allied attack uh, was to set up uh, across the English Channel at a place called Calice. And that was, we set up a fake invasion force. In fact, they went to great lengths to make this fake evasion, uh, invasion force appear to be real. Uh, this was really a decoy, but Hitler believed that the actual uh, attack would happen there. And so this was a diversion tactic. And they used everything from inflatable fake tanks covered with camouflage netting uh, and, and sometimes wooden tanks, uh, things of that nature so that once again, aerial reconnaissance picked up what they saw and thought was a large landing floor that was setting up. So they actually believed that, that the actual invasion of Normandy was supposed to be the diversion, when in fact that actually was the actual attack. Uh, we started by dropping paratroopers in behind enemy lines the night before, uh, and then, of course, early in the morning began the invasion of the beaches of Normandy. Uh, the battle was, of course, horrific. Uh, the boats that we used to come ashore were called Higgins boats, and they had a ramp that would, uh, as, as, the sh as the ship would come ashore, it could ride right up onto the beach, the ramp would come down, and the soldiers could march out. Uh, some of those first few Higgins boats to hit the beach, as, as soon as the ramp came down, um, all of the soldiers on board were simply mowed down with gunfire. Uh, because the Germans, uh, they had posts set up on a bluff overlooking the beach and were able to fire down. But eventually we overwhelmed them with sheer numbers. Uh, those soldiers faced tremendous odds, uh, very difficult for them as they were landing on these beaches. Uh, there was no way to retreat and so their only option really was to advance or stay put. And staying put wasn't very safe. Um, the battle was, was, like I said, absolutely horrific. Uh, these guys were carrying packs, uh, some as heavy as 90 pounds, and they were getting off, sometimes in the water, um, and having to make their way to shore. And, and like I said, then they're facing the gunfire, and then having to you know, dodge the enemy gunfire as they moved up. But eventually we were able to overtake the beachheads and were able to establish control. Uh, and ultimately, this becomes a major turning point of the war in Europe. After that, we really pretty much had the Germans, for the most part, on the defensive. Uh, the last German offensive came at the Battle of the Bulge. And this was a surprise offensive by the Germans. Uh, a key moment came 
at the uh, Belgian city of Bastion, and Lieutenant General George S. Patton provided relief for the soldiers at Bastion. And this became a symbol of American strength and determination. 